Serverless is kind of having a moment. Uh, when we look back in early 2017, in a few years, um, it's definitely somewhere in the hype cycle uh, and the top technologies that people are talking about, uh, positively or negatively, it's, it's way up there. And uh, I myself, like when I'm faced with a new technology, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, it's, um, it's kind of shiny, but it's, I personally feel just very deep skepticism and cynicism about its possibilities. And you know, I've been following things like Amazon Web Services Lambda for, uh, you know, for a year and a half or you know, around when it was launched. Uh, but in the last, uh, I would say, you know, five or six months in particular, I've been talking more and more with people just building really cool and impressive things on uh, functions of service platforms like Lambda and Google Cloud Functions and uh, Azure Functions as well. And so you know, across all of those things, um, I got really interested in this story of, well, like, how do you build a fast and performance you know, serverless function? And kind of what's that story? And uh, I guess, especially at New Relic, where a lot of people are interested in measurement of new technology and how that fits into existing systems, uh, kind of went down the, uh, the serverless rabbit hole and wanted to share um, just some detail about uh, kind of what I found and hopefully how that can help maybe build faster, more resilient functions. Uh, the, my first exposure to kind of a, a serverless compute architecture, I'm going to use the term functions of service from this point forward. I think it's slightly better than just saying serverless. It's a little bit more specific. Uh, but it was essentially something that looks like this, kind of a, a mobile backend for a, you know, a browser or a mobile app. And uh, it works in conjunction with some sort of proxy layer. Uh, in Amazon terminology, it's an API gateway. And you have individual HTTP endpoints that are connected to some Lambda function. That Lambda function you know, starts up, responds to the HTTP request, errors out, and all of the infrastructure, of course, since it's called serverless, is managed. Uh, the real question that I had um, kind of going into this was, you know, how do you actually measure or determine whether this is going to work or not work? And part of it, and part of the difficulty, of course, is that uh, all of these traditional operating system metrics, the infrastructure, it's not directly observable. It's not very visible. So I wanted to see if uh, I could go any deeper. Just a quick primer on the Lambda function runtime. Uh, very high level, three steps. There's some series of triggers. Um, this list uh, seems to be growing pretty quickly. Uh, you have things that are very traditional, like an operation to um, a storage bucket, so a file upload. Uh, an HTTP request, of course. But you're starting to see slightly more exotic things, like um, infrastructure events, like a virtual machine spinning up or spinning down, or even uh, events related to the health of the entire infrastructure, uh, the managed infrastructure. So um, the triggers, it's, it's a kind of an interesting, um, it's interesting to see that evolve. But obviously, the trigger functions, uh, the trigger, um, the trigger uh, invokes the actual function. So it's tied to a function that you control. You can bundle dependencies with it. That function runs. And then uh, it either returns a result, it has an error, or it times out. And of course, with these function as a service platforms, there's some uh, theoretical maximum limit to how long they can run. In Lambda, currently, it's around five minutes. So if you want to take this and say, OK, well, what, what data do we have to actually understand what's going on? It's a fairly short list. Uh, the first is just the count of errors. The second is the number of times the function was invoked. And the third is how long that function was actually running. And the last two are particularly important because they have a direct impact on your bill. So the number of times you run the function and how long that function took uh, directly impacts how much you're actually going to pay the service provider. And one really interesting thing about the function duration is that there's this thing that you learn pretty quickly. It's, it's that can vary quite widely. And there's this idea of cold starts and warm starts for these, these functions. And in a cold start in particular, there's some, you notice that there's just um, a longer runtime. And uh, if you read about it a bit more, you see this idea that there's some latency involved in actually creating the environment, which you can't observe. But then all of your initialization code, so these, this includes the libraries you're running, um, any sort of setup you're doing, uh, that also has to run as well before the handler, so this function you define inside the, uh, the application bundle, actually gets called. And compare that to a warm start, where all of that initialization, the creation of the environment's already been done, so it can respond a little bit faster. And when you're kind of looking at that function invocation time, um, this comes up in a lot of different ways. And um, people have been pretty vocal about this. And there's been a lot of different discussions on this. And I got really fascinated about this cold start and warm start issue and wanted to go a little bit deeper.
Uh, so, uh, you know, how do you go deeper in Lambda when you can't see the infrastructure, uh, where you can't actually kind of see what's actually running it? Uh, you can basically just run random Linux commands if you really want to. Um, this one in particular just runs the Who Am I commands, and if you run it, uh, you see that in Amazon Lambda, at least, you're some sandbox user underscore 1066. And if you do this enough times, it gets super annoying and it's repetitive. You're basically le reading the log output of various Linux commands you hope work or hope don't work. Uh, so I, had, I went down this, like, this other rabbit hole where um, I was like, well, you can run any binary, so why don't I run an SSH process and put it on a non-privileged port so then I can SSH into the Lambda and just run a bunch of commands before it times out in five minutes. This was a terrible idea, and it was a terrible idea for a couple of different reasons. First of all, the Lambda environment is missing uh, a massive number of dependencies for the SSHD server. Um, the configuration's awful. Um, so, of course, uh, it's like, well, Go has some nice high-level SSH libraries. Why not do that? Uh, that was easy. You can basically just copy and paste some code from GitHub, and uh, it gets you pretty far, except, of course, uh, in Lambda, at least, they don't allow inbound connections. But fortunately, you can just do something and create an SSH tunnel uh, with some reverse port forwarding, and you can actually get something working that's a really, uh, a really bare bones shell. Um, and so then, you know, if you poke around long enough and you're, you're really terrible Lambda shell, uh, you discover uh, something that's not too surprising, and that's that the proc file system, so this great resource of Linux process metadata, is, uh, is mounted in a Lambda environment, and you can read and write it. And uh, you quickly learn that, yes, you know, as, as these companies have publicly said, uh, containers are involved, uh, but a lot of the data in proc uh, predates cgroups, so uh, you actually get information on the host itself. Uh, in particular, for Lambda, you know it's a two-processor uh, Intel system. Um, you also know the maximum system memory, about 3.7 gigabytes. And you also know that 10 gigabit Ethernet networking is enabled, because you can look at the kernel modules and you realize that Amazon's loaded their uh, kind of high-performance networking module. And if you take all that and you look at the EC2, basically, spec page, uh, you realize that matches up almost perfectly, or basically perfectly to a C4 large instance, which is a compute instance, uh, or like a compute optimized instance in uh, Amazon EC2. So it seems, it, you know, it's kind of cool to see the choices that Amazon's making to power Lambda that are the same as that we're offered as a consumer, uh, or so we think. Um, so like, if we think of this Lambda host as just, you know, a C4 large instance, it kind of changes the way we think of how these Lambdas are actually running. Uh, so we have a C4 large instance with a 10 gigabit Ethernet connection, and um, you know if we use the smallest Lambda function size, 128 megabytes, uh, we know that their scheduler is probably packing these functions, yours and other people's, uh, fairly densely. Uh, and the other thing is, because the only kind of performance style we have on Lambdas is memory size, so you don't say in Amazon Lambda, I want more of the CPU, or I want more networking, you just basically increase the memory dial, you can kind of understand that as you request more memory for your Lambda function, uh, you're actually just taking more of the VM space. So uh, as they say in the docs, you know, more memory means more CPU power, and that, like, that totally makes sense and is consistent with this. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is uh, this cold start. So like, I, I, was, I still was after this, this kind of cold start idea, and it's like, well, we know, or we can theorize at least, because you know, this is just what we can infer from this metadata, uh, that you know, functions are going from warm to cold on these hosts. Uh, can we get any additional level of detail on how that's actually working? And um, from there, uh, it's pretty easy to write some really simple cold start detection code. And what you do is you essentially um, you can use a uh, you can basically uh, write to the console and the initialization code, just basically function starting, and that's only going to be called when the function is reinitialized. And the reason is that handler is what actually gets invoked when the function's warm uh, on additional triggers. And so we can have some basic uh, logging that detects cold start, and I'm going to later grab that event, and then from there. Uh, we want to basically keep the function warm. And uh, basically, the state of the art in keeping a function warm is you set a scheduled event. Uh, in some number of minutes, the, the internet magic number at this point seems to be around four minutes. You can do this natively in CloudWatch and actually have um, CloudWatch trigger the function every, you know, whatever minutes, or even write a cron tab for it. 
Uh, so it's running the function every four minutes to keep it warm, and we want to make sure that uh, you know, that function uh, stays in that VM and is ready to respond to triggers for as long as possible. Uh, this completely breaks down, by the way, if you have a highly concurrent Lambda function. So there's a disclaimer for like, this methodology in general. And so we grab the data, and then I'm, like, I'm throwing it into New Relic Insights to actually try and measure the time between cold starts. And uh, I was really curious, like, is this a constant? Uh, does this vary widely? Um, it seems, at least for this function in this region, for this particular set of days, that it was around you know, seven or eight hours. Uh, and that's kind of interesting. I mean, uh, potentially, if you have really expensive initialization, that might be uh, a cost you're, like, you're, you're willing to go with, because it just doesn't happen all that often. Uh, but the more interesting thing was you can actually see it hopping from EC2 instance to EC2 instance. Uh, so from the proc file system, you actually can get the host name. And this is not the host name of the um, container of the Lambda function. This, uh, this is the host name of the host, so like the EC2 instance itself. And uh, if you grab uptime, so the number of seconds since system boot, you kind of see that um, these things don't appear, uh, at least from this data, to uh, stick around very long. So these VMs that are running these Lambda functions uh, don't seem to stick around for days, but more in the magnitude of like 12, 14 hours. Uh, the other thing is that from the host names, uh, you, actually, um, you actually can see kind of the, the bigger subnets that these things are running on. And if you look at those subnets, uh, you see there are effectively three. And there doesn't seem to be a real pattern to which it jumps to. Uh, originally, when I was running this data, I thought it was just rotating between the uh, .12, .11, and .13 subnets, just like that. Um, it seems to be uh, more complicated. And, um, and I guess what's really interesting about that number, that there are three major subnets, is that that's also the exact number of availability zones in the region Lambda's running in. And as they've said, uh, you know, Lambda is, is basically designed for that high availability situation, and it's handled for you. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting to see kind of those, um, those patterns emerging uh, from the data you just scraped from the proc file system. Um, so between, like, from, from all that stuff uh, and from all that, if you wanted to kind of design your own function as a service, uh, what are three things we saw that uh, we see, you know, basically um, happening in this case. Uh, the first is there's some notion of high availability. Uh, so multi-availability zone. It's not multi-region at this point. Um, you also see this, uh, this idea of kind of elastic virtual machines. So their virtual machines don't appear to be uh, particularly long-lived. And you also see that cold start happen when obviously it switches hosts. So, um, so yeah, I mean, w with that in mind, there's, uh, there's this kind of automagic uh, freezing container thing going on, where when your container is not running, it's in this frozen space using the C group freezer, and then that's being scheduled on and off in response to triggers, or potentially the host is being retired, or they just have some internal scheduling algorithm that uh, runs them off. But I guess across all that stuff, the, the key secret sauce uh, to Lambda, and I think to all of their competitors too, seems to be just having a really good scheduling algorithm. Uh, ultimately, they're selling you a slice of a VM, uh, a VM that appears to be one that you can even use yourself, and uh, they're trying to maximize the utilization of that resource because they're paying for the physical hardware, and um, they're tr you know you as someone that uses these services is basically saying yeah you know given that and given the price and the performance uh, that's either good enough or not good enough, and so I, I don't know just to to kind of start to wrap things up in, in the midst of you know all the the massive uh, hype around serverless uh, yeah you know it's I, I don't think anyone. Uh, for the most part, is arguing this is the silver bullet that's going to change IT forever. And it's very well suited for the tasks that people have said it's well suited for for quite a long time. So that's the quick, computationally intensive, uh, kind of occasional things that respond to an event that's, that's very well known. Uh, the classic example, and I think one of the first Lambda examples would be generating an image thumbnail. So nothing's changed, and uh, nothing's super surprising. There's no magic unikernel or, or anything like that going on. Um, I think the, the, the challenge, one of the challenges going forward is for people evaluating uh, this technology, uh, regardless of vendor, or even looking at open source solutions, or perhaps building your own for a highly specialized workload, is uh, 
I think we've got to get better at uh, measuring and sharing those results with, uh, with the community to kind of understand the limitations of these systems and how we can get better performance. Because it's still so early that I don't think we have really great answers to that question yet. And so I, I think uh, my challenge in ending is absolutely have fun poking at these platforms, but um, definitely measure and share results so we can all get better at using them. Thanks very much.